name is Emily Barson, and I'll be your host for our webinar today. I'm also the Executive Director of United States of Care, uh, the organization putting on this event in partnership with our friends at Wellbeing Trust. Uh, first, uh, good afternoon, good morning, depending where you are. Um, first, I just want to thank you for taking time out of your schedules today to join us for what is sure to be a valuable conversation. We've convened a phenomenal panel of experts from around the nation to educate state policymakers, stakeholders, and advocates on thoughtful, essential mental health reforms with a focus on the needs among youth in this country at this perilous time for mental health and to highlight successful, politically durable pathways to those reforms. I'll intru introduce you to our expert panelists in just a moment, but before we get going, I'd love to share a bit about United States of Care and what brought us here. United States of Care is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. We work to ensure that everyone has access to quality, affordable health care, regardless of health status, social need, or income. The healthcare system isn't working for millions of people in the United States, and our research shows that people want a better healthcare system in the wake of the pandemic. And in fact, we believe there may be an opening for reforms that weren't possible before. We do our work in a unique way. We go around the country to understand, pe understand people's needs to drive healthcare reform. And we're tackling these challenges on two tracks. First, we're working in states to expand access to quality, affordable healthcare right now, because people can't wait for a perfect solution from Washington, DC. And second, we're also working to create the conditions for long-term change. We know that we need a new national conversation and new innovative solutions to build momentum to federal change that people can rely on, that won't be overturned at every election. We do all of our work in partnership with policymakers, advocates, leaders, entrepreneurs, and everyday people, all of whom make up our leadership councils. We're exceptionally lucky to have such a robust network of support and engagement, and our work could not exist without them. Our bipartisan board of directors, our founders council of over 100 experts, our Entrepreneurs' Council, who help us infuse innovation into the work that we do, and our Voices of Real Life, who helps ground us in the needs and experiences of people as we do our work. Our strategic approach fits together our mission, principles, and priorities with a world-class team of staff, advisors, and on-the-ground partnerships across the nation. Our drive to understand people's shared needs is more than data collection or story banking, it unearths the shared and diverse experiences of people that direct our policy research, inform our state level engagements with elected officials and stakeholders, and ultimately guide our vision for durable, people-centered federal reforms to meet those needs. This year, there are innumerable crises threatening the health of the nation, each more pressing than the last. In an attempt to narrow our focus for 2021 around building a better, more equitable healthcare system in the wake of COVID-19, United States of Care is committing to work at the state and federal level in the following areas, supporting COVID-19 response, expanding affordable coverage options, using virtual care as a tool for expanding equity, and championing mental health and substance use disorder care in all of our work. It's the latter most priority that we're focused on here today. As we continue to use our listening and research to ground all of our work, we are lucky enough to be able to explore voters' beliefs and needs as they relate to each of our priorities. As we reach out to policymakers, it's hugely valuable to be able to point to the broad aligned base of demand there is for solutions that bring down the cost of mental health care, which is often a barrier to access. For example, 86% of voters nationwide believe the affordability of mental health care resources should be a priority for elected officials, including 82% of Republicans and 88% of independents. This is a nonpartisan concern with broad bipartisan demand for reform. You can find a deeper analysis of this national survey and what it means for policymakers on our website at unitedstatesofcare.org. As we drill down to the state level, we see similar responses. We just completed polling in Georgia last month. And I wanna pause here for a moment because these results could not be more compelling for the parity campaign. Voters recognize the serious rising threat that mental health concerns pose to the well-being of their fellow Georgians. Voters do not believe that equal coverage for mental and physical health exists now in the state. And voters would like to see a mental health parity law passed with some haste 
and would be more likely to vote for legislators who do so. These targeted insights paired with our analyses and relationships with local stakeholders make for policy for powerful policy educational opportunities with policymakers. Beyond polling, we've released several resources over the last several months to support policymakers, both to highlight serious concerns and spotlight exciting or promising reforms. I'd like to highlight two of them that are relevant to today's conversation. First, last year, in partnership with Wellbeing Trust, United States of Care rolled out a series of state level policy recommendations focused on improving mental health and substance use disorder care delivery. The embedded action items for state leaders touch on the needs of a host of vulnerable populations, including essential workers, students, and incarcerated people, among other community members, and will continue to be relevant well beyond the nation's most serious public health crisis in a century. The second is our latest playbook, which illuminates the path of a successful push in Arizona for mental health reform from Governor Ducey's agenda priorities to the passage of a new mental health omnibus. While the legislation covering youth suicide prevention, consumer protections, and mental health parity enforcement was passed before the pandemic, the lessons about focused nonpartisan work in the face of crisis are more valuable now than ever. Of course, you can find these and other tools and sign up for updates at our website at unitedstatesofcare.org. I'm now honored to introduce our three outstanding panelists who will share their insights into addressing the mental health crisis in a few key populations and areas. Once we've heard from everyone, the four of us will come together for a discussion with the opportunity for questions from you. So throughout the presentations, please feel free to submit your questions through the Zoom Q&A function. You probably know the drill by now, and we will do our best to address them all, both in our remarks or in the conversation that follows. Our first guest is Dr. Ben Miller, who is the Chief Strategy Officer for our partner organization, Wellbeing Trust, a national foundation committed to advancing the mental, social, and spiritual health of the nation. In this role, he helps oversee the foundation's portfolio, ensuring alignment across grantees, and connecting the work to advance policy. Prior to joining Wellbeing Trust, Ben spent eight years as an associate professor in the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Ben is also a board member for Mental Health Colorado, as well as an adjunct professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the Stanford School of Medicine. Our next speaker will be Myra Alvarez, president of the Children's Partnership, a nonprofit children's advocacy organization committed to giving every child, no matter their background, the resources and opportunities they need for a bright future. Under her leadership, the Children's Partnership is building community partnerships, conducting essential research, and working to advance policies that better serve the health and well-being of children and their communities. Myra's health policy work at the Children's Partnership is informed by her experience at the federal level, having filled several roles in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services under the Obama administration, as well as in the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives. And finally, to offer some insights into a successful policy reform effort at the state level, we're joined by Christina Corrieri, joining us from Arizona, Christina is a senior policy advisor to Governor Doug Ducey, where she focuses on policy development for the governor and guidance for several state agencies, including the Department of Health Services and the Department of Economic Security. Last year, our policy team was lucky enough to interview Christina as part of a larger case study on the 2020 Arizona Mental Health Omnibus Bill, known as Jake's Law, and the key takeaways from that effort to improve mental health parity and combat a swell of youth mental health crises are captured in the playbook that I highlighted. Thank you all for being here today. I will now turn it over to Ben Miller at, from Wellbeing Trust. Ben? Yeah, thanks so much, Emily, and thanks everybody for joining us today and to the entire amazing United States of Care team for the work you all are doing. It's so great for Wellbeing Trust to be able to have such thoughtful partners and helping us advance some of the work. So we thank, we're thankful for you all today. All right, context matters here. So even in the face of some of the most dire situations many of us have ever faced, there's reason to hope. So in these brief opening remarks, I wanna really try and underscore three things. One, if we do not seriously pursue strategies for addressing mental health, all the problems I will highlight in just a minute are only gonna get worse. Mental health is foundational and often left out of meaningful policy discussions for health. Two, we have to pay close attention to the data and stop guessing at what we think is going to happen or what we think might work. And three, solutions to our nation's problems, especially for mental health, 
require all sectors to come together and for us to rethink care and delivery. Next slide, please. Okay, let's, let's get going. Um, I couldn't get an updated slide here quick enough to show you the increases from 2018 to 2019. So let me just tell you what this slide shows and why it should be burned into each of your brains. Um, it's our problem, one that many of us inherited, and yet our solutions are not coming close to even, st even stemming the tide of what you see here in front of you, slowing down this problem. These are what we call deaths of despair. These are deaths to drug, alcohol, and suicide, and they've been rising since 1999. You can see the last, last, last excuse me, data point on here from 2018. 2019 saw an additional increase up to 156,000. And then when we saw preliminary data um, from 2020, we were looking to see an additional 18%, at least in drug overdose over 2019. These trends are extremely concerning and should be discussed every night on nightly news. But sadly, there's deafening silence. We have a pandemic, yes, but we're naive to think that the pandemic is not exacerbating problems that were already here way before the virus hit. Next slide, please. Our team alongside partners at the Robert Graham Center created a predictive model to see how bad deaths of despair may get because of COVID-19. You can see the visual display of these data and the um, predictions that we made on the website linked right there in front of you. But needless to say, when you combine social isolation, economic decline, and the ongoing problem plaguing families on accessing care, you're bound to see more problems occur. Next slide, please. And just if each of us have felt the strain, so apparently has the rest of America. Uh, no one is immune to the worry and stress that comes along from such a profound level of uncertainty. Um, our collaboration with Kaiser Family Foundation uh, showed last year that half the country was feeling their mental health was negatively impacted. Next slide, please. So what we do next is on us. Will we continue to marginalize mental health, have it as an afterthought, an add-on, or will we bring it to the front and center of any discussions where it belongs? In one survey that Wellbeing Trust did with Viacom CBS, we found that nine out of 10 voters from both parties said that our elected should be doing much more for mental health. We're not quite there yet, but we need to get there quickly because it's our next generation that worries me the most. Next slide, please. As my colleagues will likely discuss, we're setting up the next generation to have to deal with a lot of emotional distress and trauma if we don't begin to pay attention to them now. Teens today are under stress. Within the US, surveys find that teens and young adults are more stressed than older people. In fact, there was one survey that was done um, that found that the most commonly reported sources of stress from young adults and, and adolescents were school and getting into a good college or deciding what to do after high school. Another survey found that 70% of teens report worry about the level of anxiety and depression among their peers, not just about their own mental health, but their peers' mental health. We must do more to help this population and we must do more to create the system for them that they want alongside them. Let's build the vision of what good could look like. Next slide, please. Our nation has been in pain. It's been hurting for some time. This is what Wellbeing Trust created Healing the Nation for, a guide for more robust policy movement for mental health. You can see the current iteration at healingthenation.wellbeingtrust.org. And as Emily mentioned, we've been really focused on trying to take this overarching framework, which I'll describe in just a minute, and apply it to states and local communities. Next slide, please. Our structures, as so many of you know, often reinforce this fragmented view of our health. It seems that the calling card for mental health for the last two decades has been integration, and we should embrace that, but we've failed pretty bad at implementing it and codifying it through policy. It's still our North Star, it's our goal, but we have to work a little bit more to make accessing care easier. This slide is our solution of sorts. It recognizes that for us to truly get to the heart of so many issues, we have to begin with in community. We have to begin in community. From there, we do the things that we know we have to do in the traditional health policy space, find comprehensive coverage options that are affordable, you know, enforce mental health parity, get people enrolled. It's this orange column I want you to pay attention to though for just a second, because this is also about changing the entire way we conceptualize access. Why don't we bring mental health and addiction services to wherever people are, wherever they present, make it consistent through policy and see that bringing care to people is one of the most significant ways we can begin to address some of the most egregious disparities that we've seen. Next slide, please. And again, for those of you interested, you can see the entire report here, including easy to download one pagers for each of the entry points that we describe in the report. Uh, of note, there's a lot of reports out there talking about mental health and policy. What we wanted to do is to make it really easy for folks to be able to go and find specific resources in whichever domain that you might be interested in from criminal justice to healthcare. Next slide, please. And here are the entry points that I just mentioned. Uh, these are grounded in evidence. Where are people going for help? 
How can we better support them when they get there? Instead of yet another referral, instead of always saying that we can coordinate better, which we do need to do, let's start by bringing mental health to wherever people are. States can be on the leading edge of making this happen. When we started Healing the Nation as a federal policy agenda, we realized instantly that we needed to go deeper into the states. And that's the document that Emily mentioned at the top of the call that we did with United States of Care. Next slide, please. So enter the United States of Care and their excellent guide on bringing Healing the Nation into the states. I'm using the same framework that I just outlined to you. This allows for us to be more thoughtful and consistent when we have discussions in our states around policy change. Next slide, please. It also allows us to go deeper on programs and policies that can help our youth. Uh, policies like those that can help our schools have increased access to mental health clinicians. Um, policies or programs that might help better identify those earlier with needs. And if you didn't see the horrible story out of New York today about the nine-year-old, um, Google that later. It's, it's another example of how we have to be able to have a different system of care for those individuals that are struggling with um, a mental health crisis and how we have to have that truly um, integrated in some form or fashion and invested in properly. This report, which I will encourage you all to read, is a great start for those of you who may not be sure where to start with mental health. It offers a vision of what good could be and it gives concrete policies that we should consider if we're serious about making an impact in our states uh, for our communities and their well-being. Next slide, please. Um, Henry David Thoreau has been attributed with saying that youth gets together with materials to build a bridge to the moon or maybe a palace on earth. Then in middle age, they decide to build a woodshed with them instead. And for me, when I read that quote, it's hard to not see this in policy. Where's our creativity? Where's our vision? If we're serious about a redesign, one that has mental health at the center, we must do more alongside our youth. Have them at the table with us as we begin to make decisions on what that next generation system is gonna be. If we don't have them at the table, what we do is we run the risk of creating something that's not in response to their needs. Next slide, please. Many of the resources that I mentioned can be found here on this website. We'll make sure that you all have those. And I wanna close by thanking you for attending today. Look forward to our discussion. Thank you, United States of Care for your leadership in this space. And for all of you for being attentive and doing what you can do to help advance mental health in all of our communities. I will turn it over to you, Myra. Great, thanks so much, Ben. And thanks so much to the entire United States of Care team for hosting today's conversation, for all of you for joining us uh, and for inviting me to be a part of this um, important panel and most important is this, this discussion um, because as Ben alluded to, I think it's there couldn't be a more uh, opportune time to ensure that we're centering the needs of our young people as we seek to rebuild our communities um, from the impacts of of COVID, but frankly, for the well-being of, of all of us. Um, so to reiterate, my name is Myra Alvarez. I have the honor of serving as president of the Children's Partnership. Uh, we are a child uh, policy and advocacy organization based in California, and we strive to advance child health equity through our meaningful partnerships, our quality research, and policy priorities that reflect the needs of the communities we serve. Partnership is in our name, and we fundamentally believe that in order to advance child well-being, we must work together across silos, across sectors to advance a shared agenda. And I'm honored to be a part of this conversation because when you consider the mental health of children and young people, there really has never been a time where working together is so clearly necessary. Right now, states like California, but states across the country, our, our federal government, it's working around the clock to ensure that we respond to COVID-19 and that we take specific steps to protect families and to uphold our values. But in the aftermath of what we have seen with this pandemic, it's our young people who have borne the brunt of the impacts of the many challenges in front of us. They've borne, those, uh, they've borne the brunt of those impacts in learning, in safety, in access to food, and in opportunities for healthy social and emotional development. And as we do seek to rebuild our communities, focusing on creating equitable systems of care and support must respond to the needs of our diverse communities, in particular, those most disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Um, it's worth emphasizing that at this time, families across the country are continuing to grapple with multiple crises. crises the COVID-19 pandemic, a challenging economy, and a national reckoning on racial injustice. But it is Black, 
Latinx and indigenous communities who continue to bear the brunt of these crises and their devastating consequences while also shouldering the frontline work that's kept our country's economy running. And it's across the board that families of color with children are being hit hardest. And it's worth emphasizing, as Ben mentioned, that the crises of today are piled on top of challenges that we knew existed before, during a very challenging last four years, but frankly, during incredibly challenging centuries of oppression. It's why across the nation, it, of the children who have died from COVID, they are overwhelmingly black and brown. And when Ben went over those statistics that he tried to you know, drill into our heads about the crises of this moment when it comes to young people and mental health, it's worth emphasizing that these startling statistics existed before the pandemic. In 2019, you know, 50% of our young people who were severely impaired with a major depressive episode did not receive treatment, 50%. In California, nearly a third of our children did not receive mental health care for any identified need in 2019, making our state rank 48th in terms of mental health care access for children. And for Black and Latinx children, they're less likely than white children, about 14% less likely to receive treatment for their depression across the country. Um, though, ne though no less likely to experience depression itself. And again, now when you fast forward and you think about the impacts of the pandemic, we see emergency room visits for mental health crises going up by a third during the last half of 2020. You see almost a third of parents who have surveyed believing that social distancing policies are contributing to emotional or mental health harm on their kids. And when we consider the impacts of the multiple crises crippling families, the way they show up is particularly harmful to the healthy development of our children and our young people. Because our children, our young people, they're not only suffering from the separation and disruption, but they're also affected by their parents' stress. Stress that's associated with lost jobs or gaps in childcare or bills that can't be paid. They're at home, they are in front of computer screens, they're missing their own friends, their own teachers, their own social interactions. Some are struggling with, um, in, with online learning, some are uh, dealing with depression or anxiety or other issues. And too many young people are dealing with grief, the loss of uh, time together with friends, grieving over the loss of key events in their lives uh, during their upbringing. And as we know, many of our young people are grappling with the loss of loved ones, given that COVID-19 has claimed more than 400,000 lives in our country. In moving forward, it's essential that we find disruptive, dis define ways to disrupt oppressive systems and old ways of thinking in order to better serve our young people ways that advance a whole child approach that consider children within the context of where they're raised, the conditions in which they're born, they grow, they live, they work, and they age, these social determinants. And these determinants we know are caused by economic, political, and social conditions, including racism. Racism is real and it is damaging and it's always played a central role in the publicly funded systems that many of our families rely on or should be able to rely on to help raise their kids. So as we consider what this conversation will do for how we, how we prepare for the future, we know a return to that status quo is unacceptable and that we have an opportunity to direct a powerful response to this crisis that recognizes the ways in which the pandemic and our systems disproportionately impact the educational, economic, and health outcomes, particularly mental health outcomes of communities of color and their children. And as we do seek to rebuild these systems, we must limit or seek to eliminate the harms that have been visited upon communities of color and instead prioritize those solutions that challenge the status quo and bring care, social services and legal supports to children, young people and families where they are, integrated into their community, where they feel safe and with partners like schools and early learning centers that they trust. We also have to focus on initiatives that refuse to allow healthcare to be transactional and recognize children and youth are part of families and that families are part of communities. 
thinking about support for youth serving providers that may not be part of the traditional mental health system, but that recognize the incredible impacts on the mental health and well-being of youth serving programs. And finally, a validation of the brilliance of community leaders, recognizing that those closest to the problems are closest to the solution, as the quote goes. Um, and this is, you know, peer support. We know it's already happening. It's developmentally appropriate, and we should be arming young people with the tools and support and accessing, accessing resources to be the effective advocates for their and their peers' healing. And we can start that powerful response with where we know our young people are, thinking about critical partnerships with schools and early learning programs to really integrate mental health and emphasize the overall well being of our young people. The nation's current patchwork of policies, our disconnected funding streams, our lack of coordination between agencies and among levels of government, and of course, the burdensome administrative complexity, it's hindering on our country's systems from delivering on the promise of child well being. And we can and must do better for our kids. So we recognize that as this last year has shown us, whether it was the protests that were calls for justice, whether it's the, the, the glaring inequities in, in COVID-19 and its impact on our communities and what many of our, of our families are saying today, we're looking for calls for justice. And the calls for health justice are intertwined with the calls for racial justice. And it's an opportunity to really center mental health, center the holistic needs of our kids, and use our community leaders and our community hubs like schools and early learning centers to really strengthen the engagement of our families and of our young people um, to identify those solutions for the future. The ability of our young people to emerge from this crisis healthy and educated depends on all of us to fully invest in their recovery and their resilience. And I'm looking forward to working together through this conversation and, and in the future uh, to make that happen. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Christina. Thank you so much, um, Myra, and thank you, uh, Ben and the United States of Care for having me here for this discussion. Um, as Emily said, mental health is a nonpartisan issue um, or a bipartisan issue. And I think we proved that here in Arizona in our most recent legislative session. So in 2020, Governor Ducey had stated that one of his priorities was going to be mental health parity. Uh, and we worked with our legislature to make sure that happened. Um, I wanna give you some background on why uh, the governor felt this was so important. So the suicide rate in Arizona has increased from 15.4 deaths per 100,000 in 2007 16, 18 per 100,000 in 2017. Uh, that's currently four Arizonans each day dying from suicide, which is higher than the number of Arizonans who die in car crashes uh, each day. Um, the groups at higher risk include our seniors, our teens, our veterans, and our Native American population. It's tragic because we know that suicide is preventable if people receive the behavioral health services that they need. Unfortunately, many people who are commercially insured have trouble accessing those services for necessary mental health treatment. The studies have shown that over 50% of individuals with, with mental illness do not receive the behavioral health services that they need. And a 2016 study showed that 28% of patients had to use an out out of network provider for mental health services, while only 3% had to use an out of network provider for primary care. Um, and that creates a real barrier for families. Um, this bill wasn't the governor's first effort in the area of mental health. We really started to dig into that in about 2017. During that year, uh, the governor worked with the legislature to invest $10 million in funds to access, which is our state Medicaid program, to expand behavioral health services on campus. As Ben said, one of the things that we need to do is to meet children where they are. Because of that investment in year one, we were able to increase the number of behavioral health services provided to children at their school by 250%. Uh, because of that investment in the first two school quarters of 2019, our Medicaid service provided 2,007,398 behavioral health services on campus, just a dramatic increase. Um, the governor's budget 
uh, that was passed in 2019 for FY 2020 also included $20 million for schools to hire additional counselors. And in 2018, the, the legislature passed and the governor signed a bill requiring suicide prevention training for public school employees. Uh, in the latter part of 2019, we started to work on what became known as the mental health omnibus, also referred to as Jake's Law. We worked with stakeholders that included mental health providers, as well as families that had been affected both by suicide, as well as by mental illness. We also had the insurers at the table to discuss what the problem was and how we were going to go about fixing it. Um, that stakeholder work led directly to the bill that was introduced. We introduced mere bills in the House and Senate. We had fantastic sponsors in both. Uh, we had Republican Kate Brophy McGee on the Senate side, who was our chairwoman of the Senate Health and Human Services Committee, and Republican uh, Jeff Weninger on the House side. Um, we were very lucky that we had taken that strategic approach because this was one of the only major uh, reform legislation pieces passed last session and one of the last bills passed before uh, COVID-19 uh, really took off here in this country. So the bill and, and our legislature had to adjourn. So this bill built on the recent act actions of improving access to behavioral health care and saving lives. So while we had already been working with our Medicaid program, uh, in which many of our most vulnerable individuals um, are enrolled and where the state has a lot of control because it's a state program, we knew we also had to look at the commercial market. So what this bill does is it gives the Arizona Department of Insurance the authority to enforce the mental health parity, parity law and to write rules to ensure that that happens. Our Department of Insurance is usually a department that works with the insurance company. That is who they see as their stakeholders. That is who they hear from. So we wanted to ensure that all of the voices were at the table and that those most impacted have a say in the development of the rules. So we created a mental health parity advisory committee at the department. Um, the, that uh, mental health parity uh, committee has a majority of providers and families. There are insurers on, uh, on the committee, but they are a minority group. So there are providers uh, and there are families. There are families that have been impacted both by suicide as well as families who have children that are receiving behavioral health. We also have families on that committee that are commercially insured, as well as families um, that have children in the access program so they can talk about the services that are available there. Uh, the bill also requires insurers to report to the department on how they are actually insuring compliance. So they will, in detail, have to prove that they are in compliance. Um, we also created what we called the Children's Behavioral Health Services Fund, we modeled this on a fund we created in our Opioid Epidemic Act a few years before. Uh, in the Opioid Epidemic Act, we wanted to make sure uh, that, that cost was never a barrier for somebody to receive substance abuse treatment. And so we put $10 million into this uh, substance use disorder fund. That was for individuals who were not eligible for Medicaid um, and either had commercial insurance or no insurance. Uh, they, the provider could bill this fund to be able to cover the individual's co-pays um, or up to their deductible before their insurance took over to ensure that there was no barrier for them getting care. We understood that it was going to take a while to adopt uh, the new rules under mental health parity and that they are likely not going to be into effect until January 1, 2022. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we were helping people right away uh, and created this Children's Behavioral Health Services Fund. We funded it with $8 million uh, in the first year. So what happens with this fund is if the uh, school identifies that a child has uh, a behavioral health need, they are able to refer them to this program. Uh, this program does the same thing. If they are eligible for Medicaid, they will get them enrolled in that. If they are not eligible for Medicaid and are either uninsured or underinsured, then this fund will pay uh, for their deductibles and co-pays, again, to make sure uh, that cost is not a barrier to children getting the behavioral health care that they need. 
It also prohibits insurance companies from denying coverage for behavioral health services simply because they're delivered in an educational setting. One thing that we were realizing as we expanded our behavioral health services on campus for our, our access, our Medicaid patients, we would have individuals who were insured uh, by Medicaid uh, through a plan such as a United um, that would be able to get those services on campus. But if somebody was insured via United Commercial rather than United Medicaid, they were not eligible for those same services simply because of where the location was. So we said, it's gonna be location neutral. You cannot deny coverage for services simply because they're in an educational setting, much as Ben said, to meet the children where they are. We also created a suicide mortality review team to review each death by suicide and provide policymakers with improved data and recommendations to further reduce suicide rates. This is modeled on our successful mortality review teams that we use for substance use disorder, for child abuse deaths, and for maternal uh, mortalities. And finally, um, we required the Department of Health Services to adopt discharge rules for patients that have been receiving inpatient treatment for a suicide attempt or for individuals who have expressed suicidal ideation uh, while in treatment to ensure that they are uh, linked up to the appropriate follow-up services and community resources uh, before they are discharged. So this bill had to go through four legislative committees, um, health committee on both sides, as well as appropriations committee on both sides, um, as well as the floor of the House and the Senate. Um, that happened in a pretty speedy time. The bill was introduced in late January and passed in early March. And through all of the committees, as well as the floor, it never received a single no vote. Um, so I think you can see that that is um, about as bipartisan as it can get. And I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Great, thanks so much, uh, Christina. I'll invite my uh, fellow speakers to join us back um, in the on camera. Um, and thanks uh, to all of you really for, the, for those remarks and really bringing the different perspectives that you have in the work that you're doing um, as to different, different uh, views on the challenges as well as some of the solutions. Um, I'd love to open it up um, for some discussion. Um, first, uh, you know, really, and some of you touched on this in your remarks, but um, what, uh, you know, sort of specifically how we've seen the pandemic impacting the mental health policy landscape. Um, we've talked about how it's compounded many of the challenges, certainly, um, that people are experiencing. Um, and I'm curious if, if our panelists see um, this as, you know, opening up opportunities for reforms and, you know, really shining a light on some of these issues that we've people who work in this field have certainly known and been familiar with but you know how you see the the pandemic impacting that landscape um let me start with you uh myra um definitely i think it's been an eye-opening experience for millions of people i think across the country um you know i think for many advocates in the mental health space the challenge with rising mental health to the top has been stigma, has been just a lot of people don't want to talk about mental health challenges or um, just culturally, there's just a number of different barriers. However, what the pandemic has exposed to so many people, as Christina said, across the political spectrum has been the frankly, traumatic effects of not being in, in company with our families, with our friends. Social isolation is impacting all of us. And many, many families, many parents are seeing it in their kids in the, you know, the, the way they're eating or their behaviors or um, even their outcomes in school. So really it's like, it's become personal for everybody to really consider the impacts of this pandemic. Um, and in particular, you know, very much so for those that are hardest hit, whether they are you know, working on the front lines in the healthcare industry or working on the front lines delivering groceries or, you know, waiting tables and still trying to serve people. There are a number of different ways in which the pandemic is, is impacting families. But I think to, to the really quickly, Emily, 
it, on top of that are all these other issues, right? It's a challenging economy that is directly associated with mental health, thinking about poverty and its impacts, but also, you know, rate, like just the, the, the multiple acts of racial injustice that we have seen that have disproportionately impacted black children, black families, Latino children with the, the immigration crisis, just really thinking through how all of this piled together is raising issues about mental health and well-being. So to your point, it, it has definitely allowed us to peel back that onion and commit to making sure we do something about it. And, and thank I'll, you. Oh, ben, please I, go ahead. I just, yeah, I got to add that because you mentioned an onion. And so I, I couldn't go, help but go with this. When you, when you think about, you know, those of us that like to cook peeling back onions, you know, it usually it leads to this response where we have tears in our eyes. And I have to say, um, that's probably happened more to me the last year than I can, you know, care to recount. And a lot of it is, dri is driven by these disparities that you mentioned. And I think that we have to put our finger on this because the physical health disparities that were so egregious prior to COVID and during COVID, even with vaccine, uh, uptake uh, mirror the same disparities that we see on the mental health side. And so when we come together and we begin to talk about policy solutions, I think it is, it is almost like the most important thing that we can say, which is that we have to apply an equity lens with how we think about our policy solutions. If we don't, then what happens is that we run the risk of further enhancing disparities. Let me give you a concrete example of this. Um, so I'm a huge fan of what's occurred with telehealth. I think it's been tremendous to be able to have folks pick up their phone and talk to their clinicians, do everything they need to do. But there are unintended consequences with seeing this as the latest, greatest you know, new thing because not all communities have access to broadband. Not all communities have a quiet place they can go and talk to their you know, clinician for 30 minutes. Not all communities are gonna be able to take the time off work to have access to their clinicians. So we run the risk of furthering those disparities if we're not paying attention to it from the beginning. Um, last thing I'll say, and then I'll be quiet. Emily, because you, you mentioned this. To me, mental health during this pandemic has been something that everyone has experienced, whether or not you can name it. And so it begs the question of, you know, why aren't we at a you know, policy level talking about what we could do more? States are gonna go through some major uh, hard times with their deficits around their budgets. I mean, it's just, it's probably uh, the writings on the wall for that. So in the face of that, does that give us an opportunity to really think a little bit differently around restructuring what we're doing, think about how we pay for what we're doing, and then ultimately come back around to maybe even redesigning uh, to have a system that's much more integrated? So I know that was a lot, but you, you opened it up there. So thank you. Well, I, I want to give a, a little bit of the bright side too with telemedicine. I, I agree um, that there are disparities and we have to focus on those. Um, I'm actually going to be testifying later today on the omnibus that we're working on this year, which is all on telehealth. And we had to, at the beginning of the pandemic, go ahead and address some of those disparities, um, which included the fact that prior to an executive order the governor did in March, uh, telemedicine was only available if it was audio visual real time like what we're doing now. That is a challenge uh, for at least three groups of people. Uh, one would be our elderly and I give the example that uh, I've tried to use Zoom with my 95 year old grandfather um, and it's 30 minutes of frustration and then we see his shoes. Um, so we have certain populations that have technological difficulties. We also have individuals, especially in a, a state like Arizona with large rural um, uh, portions of our state where there's not broadband. And then we have low income folks who may be in an ur urban area where there is broadband, but they simply don't have access to the same um, smart devices that someone else does. So uh, we allowed audio only uh, based on the patient's um, a lack of technology, lack of access to broadband, or uh, quite frankly, their preference, because you have some that might not want to show, say, the state of their house. I think one bright side that we've seen is that the access to telehealth has actually increased the use of mental health care. In our Medicaid system alone, uh, we saw over a 28% increase in the number of folks that are, are using uh, behavioral health care. So uh, I do think that it's one way to, to get people that immediate access uh, where before they might have waited weeks. Yeah, th thanks for those comments. I think this is really um, on point and certainly something we're thinking a lot about at United States of Care as to you know um, how telehealth can not just make care more convenient for people who already have access, but you know can really be a tool in, in 
um, reducing those disparities. And as one of the participants point out, you know, making sure that uh, platforms are accessible and you know that they can uh, be reaching pe uh, people with disabilities as well. Um, Christina, we got a couple of questions for you that I'll sort of um, stack up if that's all right. One, you know, just sort of asking for the the links to the um, legislation and framework. Um, we'll make sure that we share the playbook that we worked on that highlighted a lot of the um, specifics from Arizona so that uh, folks participating here will get that. Um, but questions about some of the specific populations. Um, first, how you're working with local community coalitions on addressing substance use disorder and mental health in rural areas, and also whether um, Arizona was able to measure the utilization rates by ethnic community or by socioeconomic uh, status. Um, I don't think that we have that data yet. So our Children's Behavioral Health Fund, so the usage for that $8 million, that just opened on October 1 of 2020. And so uh, I like to ask our Medicaid program as frequently as possible if I can get those usage numbers, um, mostly because I'm, I, I'm concerned that maybe you're going to have one or two school districts that really know how to use this and, and others who don't and wanting to make sure that there's a fair and equitable access to it. We are working with our Department of Education. I'm told that I have to be a little bit patient because they only get those quarterly um, results. So uh, we've now been through one quarter and I hope to have those soon, but that is something that we are, we are definitely going to be looking at. Uh, we have a lot more information on the use from the Substance Use Disorder Fund um, and I'd be happy to share that. Great, thank you. Um, a comment from the participants. I, I love health justice. That should be a trending term. So I think that uh, just passing that along, I think uh, from this conversation, it sounds like probably our panelists uh, would agree. <laughs> um, uh, one of our participants um, raised the question about, you know, uh, reaching policy change at the state level is important. And how can we get more granular um, at the local level, um, school systems, local law enforcement, et cetera, um, so that youth in local communities um, can help drive the policy discussion. Um, I will first, you know, again, plug uh, the resource that um, that Ben referenced, um, the Healing the Nation framework um, that does get into some of those entry points, knowing that just focusing on the um, broader healthcare system isn't going to reach people where they need to be, um, but would love to uh, open it up for more comments about how to, you know, incorporate those local community driven um, solutions. Uh, ben, you were nodding. Do you want to kick us off? <laughs> sure. Thanks, Emily. And thanks for the question. Yeah, I, I agree with the person who asked it because I think that, you know, we have to consider policy at all levels. And the one uniting thread here is that there needs to be a vision of what we're working towards. So whether it's at your local level with your, your, your mayor, your county commissioners, all the way up to your Medicaid directors and the governor, all the way up to Congress. I mean, we have to be thinking about what is it we're actually trying to do. So Wellbeing Trust alongside the United States of Care, as you already mentioned, put up forward a guide for states. We also put forward a guide for local leaders, um, more public health officials, commissioners, um, mayors, and I'll put the link in the chat here in just a second, because we actually were trying to, to thread that needle that I just described so that folks had some consistent way that they can approach the issues of policy without getting lost. Like, oh, what's the latest guide I should use or what are the three things I should ask for? So that's one, that's one thing I, I, I'll give you right there is that we have a resource on that. Two, and this is a really simple one, but it's one that I think we're finding a lot more, especially now that we're in the Zoom universe, is that you gotta show up at the places that people are having the conversation. And I know this is not gonna be lost, it's gonna be, um, you know, most of you have already participated in this stuff, but when you don't show up at the meeting, like I, the example I was giving with the youth, sometimes, you know, what happens gets, decisions get made with little or no regard to what you as the community member actually think should happen. And so you gotta show up. And that means that you've got a plan, you've got to figure out a way to take off work, have somebody watch the kids. In a post Zoom world, when we're all done with COVID, um, you know, hopefully we could be back out there doing these things. But I would say to folks, like if you don't show up and you don't get engaged, you're probably not gonna be able to have your voice heard. I also think um, just building on, on Ben's comments is, really recognizing the need to continuously engage uh, providers in the space around mental health. Because I think we all fall victim to 
being comfortable in our silos, right? We're very comfortable with what we know and the areas that we know when we really recognize that uh, educators, mental health providers, social workers, early learning program leaders, they wear many hats as they take care of our families. And it's much more than just the one task that they're supposed to have as a teacher or as a, as a childcare provider. They're actually trusted hubs and resources for families in so many other ways. So how can we give them the tools and resources to live out that role most effectively? So one of the things that we're doing is um, next month or, or the week month after we're still deciding on timing is we're going to launch a series around early childhood mental health and our child care workforce, recognizing that how do we empower our workforce leaders, validate their leadership and, and, and um, the role in the community that they play and make sure that they have the information around early childhood mental health and how it may manifest in young kids right differently. And I think it's very similar in thinking about our community members. Our communities have been leading the way for so long. How do we listen better? How do we create the forums and opportunities where we can um, challenge our system to better respond to those needs? Here in California last week, we had a mental health commission and a, a large part of our commission meeting was dedicated to um, programs that were focused on communities of color, LGBTQ, other marginalized communities, and the programs that the, that the communities themselves, for us, by us, that they were running, and the importance of our traditional systems sponsoring or supporting those initiatives, recognizing that learning Black history and culture is a mental health intervention for young people, or learning Filipino culture and history is a, an intervention. And that in and, of, in and of itself is a little bit groundbreaking, but critical as we think about what do our systems look like in the future. I would say we've made sure to have family voices at the table through this whole process. They were there as we were developing the bill. As I said, with the advisory committee, I believe we have three slots on the committee for, um, for insurers, we have approximately the same number for providers, so they can speak from that provider's perspective, but we have four slots on the committee for family members, so they actually have the most. We have a mother who lost her son uh, to suicide um, and had challenges with commercial insurance. We have another person who lost her sister to suicide, had challenges with commercial insurance, and we have uh, two low-income parents whose um, uh, children have been in the behavioral health system as well and received services on the school campus so they can speak from a position of experience. Also in that bill, we authorized the Department of Insurance to hire a specialist in behavioral health to lead up those efforts. She has a history in behavioral health. She does not have a history uh, in insurance or working in the insurance space. So we're making sure that we're crafting that uh, voice around um, those that are most affected. I love that. Thanks for highlighting that, Christina. As as a state policymaker, do you have advice for you know advocates at the you know at the more local level as to how they can um, have their voices you know be part of that that type of process that you're describing? Um, you know, anybody that reaches out to us, we respond when we wanted to get um, some minority members onto that committee. I actually reached out to one of the FQHCs who works uh, largely in the Hispanic low income population and they were able to connect us uh, to someone there to make sure that that voice that we wanted uh, was on the committee. I would say for anyone doing this work uh, in another state, start early. Um, Speak often. I think our stakeholder meetings were every week or every other week starting in August and have every, every voice at the table. And even though I think some, some people want to always paint insurers as the enemy, they're a stakeholder too, and you have to have them at the table. Um, that does not mean you agree with everything they say, uh, but you can work together. I think uh, in addition to Arizona's being very bipartisan, it was the only state that I've ever seen where all of the individuals signed in in support, all of the providers signed in in support, but all our insurance companies signed in in support too because they heard what the issues were. And they saw that the governor's office uh, was at the table and part of the discussion. Um, so it's much better uh, to work together um, than have something that they haven't had a, um, at least been able to be part of the discussion move without them. Great, thank you. 
Um, I know we're coming up on the, the bottom of the hour, so I want to make sure that, uh, that we end on time. Um, maybe we'll just uh, do, this is a, a hard one to do as a lightning round, but um, just if anyone wants to jump in briefly, um, sort of a broad question to end us out um, as informed listeners. Um, what have you learned in the last year that personally surprised you or caused you to think differently about the state of healthcare uh, in the United States? So kind of a, a big question um, to chew on, but uh, certainly a, lo a lot uh, has been exposed. Um, but as, as folks who have worked in this field for some time, I'm curious how, how you would react to that question. I don't know if I have a good answer to that. That's a great question. Uh, I need to think on that a little bit more. I, I guess maybe one of the things I've been surprised by has been folks enhanced understanding you know, we, we knew how bad things were before, right, as we talked about, but I think folks have really had a lot of time to spend looking at some of the reasons why it was that bad from our public health infrastructure, not having the adequate investment. So some of the challenges that we faced just getting our kids back into school. I think people are now a lot more hip to what it means to have, you know, solutions for public health, for mental health. So I think that's one thing is that the country probably knows a little bit better now what public health is and why we should invest in it. I, um, I'm going to talk about like, um, what like has, I guess it's a surprise. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think what I've been most inspired by has been the idea that civic engagement is mental health, particularly for young people. And as we see young people lead the way when it comes to movements um, on the ground, right? When it, when thinking about, like one of the questions was about policing and the impact on black children's health. You know, the only reason we're seeing real movement in our school districts in California is because young people are raising their voices and are saying, this is what we need to, to feel healthy and succeed in school. And I think really understanding and appreciating the connection between civic engagement, our agency, using our voice and our mental health and well being. And validating that connection has inspired me, has surprised me, and has really, I think, lit a fire under our work to recognize that that agency and power is across the board, across our communities. And the opportunity to engage, either if it's voting or protesting or marching or calling your congressman, those are all opportunities to recognize we can make a difference. And it starts with us. And I think that um, I'll carry that with me for this year and, and for the future. I guess I, I would say, I think that 10 years ago, talking about mental health, people just wouldn't have talked about it. It was something that other families deal with and not something that their family deals with. It hadn't really come into the mainstream yet. And I, I really think that this, it, it had already started moving toward mainstream before this, uh, but this pandemic brought it to every family. And I think it's something that's easier for everyone to talk about now. And that's a good thing. Thank you. Those are those are great insights, and certainly we could keep going. Um, sorry to folks who we didn't get to all the questions um, in the chat, but really um, a big thank you to everyone for joining today, and especially um, to our panelists, uh, Myra, Christina, and Ben. Thanks so much for sharing your time and your insights with us. Um, I would encourage all of you to go to our website at unitedstatesofcare.org to check out the resources that we've talked about. Um, today, as well as uh, a, a full deep body of work uh, available to support um, efforts in this year's legislative sessions and beyond. Um, and please sign up so you can get updates and join us at future events um, virtual for now and hopefully uh, someday again in person face to face. Um, and, you know, really just look forward to continuing our work with all of uh, the policymakers, stakeholders, advocates, and concerned folks who have been uh, partnering with us um, as we strive to build a better healthcare system um, that can withstand the next crisis. So thanks to everyone. Be safe and take care.